Messi. Oh, what a goal oh, that is! Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Bola Bola Show podcast. It's been a long time since uh, we had a show for you guys, but it's good to be back and good to not, I'm not alone this time. I'm together with my two co-host buddies. First and foremost, Bala, how's it going? Yes, Ivan Elmin, thanks for the opportunity again after so long. Hopefully this will kick start again with a lot of our podcast. Uh, isn't it true, Elmin? Yeah, it's uh, it's really been a while, huh? but it's good to get the ball, the ball rolling again. Yeah, so how's things? Did you guys, everything is good there? Yep, so far all good on my side. And uh, let's bring back our show with a bang, Elwin. So who do we have on our guest this week? Yeah, so today on our show, you know, we are really honoured to welcome uh, the CEO of the Malaysian Football League, F- MFL, Mr. Stuart Ramalingam. Hello, Stuart. How are you doing? Hi, guys. Hi guys. Even Elvin Bala, thank you for having me. Pleasure and honour to be on your show, actually. Yeah, it's really it's really an honor uh, for for you to be here. So really, thank you for your time, you know, Stuart. And you know, uh, let's let's just start off, you know, casually. You know, maybe you could share with us, you know, your love and your passion for football. Where it all started? Oh, uh, you. Uh, I I I think I don't. I don't. I'm, it's nothing special. I think you and I kind of share the same background. I'm sure you played the game before when you were young. You watched it mm-hmm. with friends and family. So. It was a sense of unity. It was a sense of uh, upbringing. My my social circles revolved around football. I used to play the game at a very young age and uh, and, and quite competitive. But you know, injury took me out of the game. But mm-hmm. uh, I think the love of the game was the was the thing that kind of drove my life compass to to get to where I I have been in the in the football fraternity and in my football lifetime. So the, the passion came from my dad. I have to say, my dad was uh, was a worked in PKNS. He used to play the game there, and you know, in PKNS there were a lot of uh, superstars, Malaysian superstars at that time that used to play there. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I I grew up under that wing, and my elder brother Kevin he used to play, and and I used to join all these these bigger boys, and and it was really like a social social circle, right? And that that was life before for us. Very different today than our kids. And how they they uh, have social circles and friends, but uh, my life revolved around the game, and and I believe you know that that kind of uh, lit the passion in me. Mm, all right, sounds okay. great. There, yep. Yeah, I think it sounds like a pure passion of a football fan. <laughs> uh, I think I think this passion has brought you to becoming the CEO of the MFL. And, yeah. Uh, upon you returning to the office and the first time, you know, like the. Uh, what as I'm sure you have a lot of vision and uh, a lot of passion to it. So, what yeah. what particular areas that you feel needed to be addressed immediately and with, with immediate task? Well, tough, tough question, Bala. The only problem is that I have to answer that question with telling you a bit about the journey to get there, and mm-hmm. the journey to get there is the is the part of will probably allow me to to define how I what I needed to do immediately when I got in and the critical areas. So. Uh, just re- rewinding about 10 years back, you know, I used to work in FIFA and then I used to work in uh, AFC and then I I worked for four years as, as the head of a Japanese sports organization as well. And that experiences led me back to FAM for three years and coming back into the, to, into the Malaysian uh, football fraternity and the football industry that first three years kind of balanced me back into the local system uh, and, and helped me realize uh, the do's and don'ts, the, the constraints and the restrictions and the opportunities and the, and the possibilities that the industry allows us. Uh, and, and from that three years, and then while I moved back to, to, to the league, uh, it allowed me to be a lot more realistic with what could be done in a short term uh, objective and what can be midterm and what can be long term. So immediately the critical areas that needed to be approached uh, because I joined on the 1st of September. Joining on the 1st of September for every other person is a normal period. For Malaysian football is like the start of the Malaysia Cup, the end of the league, start of the Malaysia Cup. So it's banged straight into a very busy period. And, mm-hmm. and that 
just allowed you to sink your teeth into the operations of MF, MFL, see how the, the wheels are turning internally, competition operations with media, with our broadcast, with our partners, with our, our legal team that needed to re, you know look into all of these issues pertaining to COVID and SOPs and, and all of that. But the, the immediate thing that I know I needed to do come the first year, which is this year, 2022, was to re-adapt our commercial model because everything revolves around money, right? So uh, I, I'm an accounting and finance background person, but people see hmm. me as a very commercial person. But actually, I understand that the running an organization, you run it on revenue and you manage it on expense, right? So the more money you make, the more you can do. So at understanding the commercial uh, ability of the asset that you have in this instance, the, the competitions that we have uh, required me to kind of wrap my head around how can I make more money for MFL. So this year alone, uh, we've, we've actually reached about 96% uh, higher revenue than last year. And that's Ooh. merely on the revamp of our commercial packaging. So this year we've signed brands like Luno, Post Malaysia, uh, Proviton, uh, Aleph Oil, uh, u Mall, uh, And these are brands that are not traditionally involved in Malaysian sport nor football. So that in itself should show that, hey, you know, MFL is talking maybe a bit, bit more corporate, a bit more commercial, hence new brands that have never been involved in sport, seeing Malaysian football as a, as a worthy asset to jump on board. So the commercial model was the first thing that I needed to fix to just prove belief and increase revenue. Uh, our, our broadcast contract is tight at the moment. So I can't change the competition structure. I can't change the broadcast revenue because that is tied to an existing contract. Nevertheless, that existing contract ends at the end of this year. And that leaves us an opportunity now to look at the co competition structure as well. Mm -hmm. So those are the type of two immediate things that I needed to, to sink my teeth into. I think the, the mid-term objectives will be our entire operations of MFL and club development. I believe club development, the stronger the clubs, the better the league as well. And uh, just yesterday, we completed our CFO's workshop. So we had a workshop to allow uh, uh, speakers. Uh, we had a speaker from Singapore. We had a speaker from AFC. Uh, teaching uh, our local uh, finance controllers in clubs what is it like to run a football club from a financial sense, financial operations. So that, those are the type of things that we are, we are taking to, to ensure that we develop stronger professional clubs. And in the long run, definitely developing other um, verticals of revenue, e-sport, uh, digital income, social content, so forth. So that's kind of like the way the short, mid and long term uh, objectives are and those are the critical areas I thought I needed to to immediately uh, uh, address. Mm -hmm. Okay and you mentioned about the structure of the competition because if you look at the, the league right now MSL has 12 teams and the Premier League has 10 teams it's not really sufficient enough for players to really you know develop their game improve and all that so are there plans for MFL to increase the number of teams especially in the top two top two flights of the, of the football league? Yes uh, definitely uh, um, with, the, with the end of that broadcast contract, which is tied to number of games, competition names and formats, uh, it was very hard to change it this year, but that leaves us an opportunity for next year. Uh, we have uh, ongoing discussions internally with regards to how we can improve the competition format. Uh, understanding that below the Premier League, if you look below the Premier League, uh, you don't see many or there are no professional clubs to even take the spot of the available two spots in the Premier League. Mm -hmm. And that in mm -hmm. itself uh, allows you a, an opportunity. And for me, I see always see a, a negative point as an opportunity to develop more football clubs. So uh, we, we can't just fill a spot and increase number of teams without understanding who you're increasing it with. The stability of, of, of the additional teams, is it going to be a huge competitive gap or is it going to be a huge uh, club gap as well? Because uh, M3, the clubs run on maybe 500,000 and max per year. Uh, at Premier League, they run about 5 million ringgit a year. So uh, at minimum, right? So that, that, that bridge and that gap between the, 
the current clubs in M3 to M2 and M1, the gap is a bit too big. So we'll have to look at the entire holistic ecosystem. It's not merely about increasing number of games, increasing number of games, but if it's non-competitive games, the intensity is too low, that does not even serve a competitive benefit, football benefit, nor a commercial benefit. So uh, that entire refocus, we actually, we've worked on actually a, a, a huge paper on this restructure. Uh, we're in discussions with, with, uh, FAM on this uh, and, and clubs as well to ensure the buy-in uh, from the football clubs. Playing more matches requires a longer season. As you know, our season is already tight with, 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 with uh, calendar changes that we're facing this year. But nevertheless, definitely, there is a, there's a huge uh, movement on trying to, to improve the number of games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you're mentioning about the tight schedule and all that. Um, the, the thing is, you know, last year, the FA Cup was uh, was not held uh, because of the pandemic and all that. And, uh, you know, the winner of uh, the 2021 Malaysia Cup was uh, awarded the place in the AFC Cup. So, you know, is this going to be a, a normal thing moving forward uh, that MFL will propose for years to come? Because the on, on the fans' uh, point of view, you know, Malaysia Cup being a very prestigious uh, tournament, right? Usually the incentive for the winner is they don't get a place in any of these uh, AFC uh, you know, competitive structure there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it's reversed back to the original form. So uh, this year, the FA Cup winner will get the spot in the uh, AFC Cup. So okay. first, we'll go to Champions League. Second in the league, we'll go to AFC Cup. And the champion of FA Cup will go to uh, the AFC Cup. So uh, Malaysia Cup will offer no uh, AFC position. It was a temporary uh, exercise. Uh, it was done. Uh, though that decision was done before I joined MFL. Uh-huh. Uh, but I believe it was done on the context that the competition was cancelled and that's it. Uh-huh. Malaysia Cup has its own aura and prestige. you know, yeah. And that does not need any more benefit to put to that. Uh, uh-huh. If we want to grow a competition and grow a competition with a bit of incentive, uh, then we should allow that competition to carry a bit of of, of reward at the end of it. Malay- winning the Malaysia Cup, the Malaysia Cup has its special uh, space in the football industry and we don't need to add more to it. But uh, it also, uh, if you look at, uh, at, this, at the English League, the League Cup doesn't have any value, right? People send their, their reserve teams to, to play in the League Cup, right? Yeah, yeah. Or the correct. Carabao I, Cup in this, yeah, right? So, yeah. so we don't want the FA Cup to be a non-competition as well. So mm. spreading the slot and allowing the competition to grow with that reward allows it to become a very competitive tournament as well. Mm. So, so, so you're saying Malaysia Cup is just based on that, that uh, historical prestige of just winning it and that itself is like good enough, but you would like to focus more on the FA Cup incentivizing the winner. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, I mean, today, today uh, we are restricted by the number of slots in AFC competitions. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is, you know, with the great performance of JDT in the group stage of yeah. uh, Champions League, uh, there is an opportunity for us to get four slots in the future in 2024. I sit on the AFC Competitions Committee. Mm-hmm. So uh, uh, we see that the opportunity for Malaysia is opening up. We hope that Kuala Lumpur and Kedah do well in the AFC Cup this year. And with the performance of those two uh, clubs, as well as the as the results that we've seen from JDT, uh, there may be an opening of four slots for Malaysia in the future. Mm-hmm. And if that happens, then there's an opportunity to put one with the Malaysia Cup. So uh, mm-hmm. it, it is only a limited slot. Uh, that, that is why we, we have to pick where we put. Uh, but if, if the slots increase, there's there's no reason why we don't add uh, opportunity at the Malaysia Cup as well. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank right. you. If you talk about the uh, topic of prioritization, it's been a major challenge for a number of uh, Malaysian football teams. I think we don't need to say, I think there's not many which actually initially uh, comply to this uh, requirement. And looking about it as to date, what is your overall view of this entire process which uh, begins somewhere in uh, 2022, uh, 2020, right? Yes. Uh, thanks, man. That's that's. Uh, I'm I'm sorry if I'm long winded with my answers, um, Bala. Uh, oh, no, yes, no problem at all. <laughs> no problem. Take, take, take your time, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> the the reason is is yeah. best to get as much uh information and fact across. 
because then the yeah. understanding is deeper and better. Um, mm-hmm. The privatization pro- program actually uh, was uh, started 13 years before. Yeah, mm-hmm. and um, it was uh, to be implemented uh, a few years before I joined. And when, when I joined, uh, Dato Amidin, the then general secretary, became president. One of his biggest initiatives that he asked me to, to kind of uh, push forward was the privatization. And if you did not know that Malaysia was the last country in Asia to go through the privatization process. Wow. So, uh, the, 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 you know, when you, when, you, when you go through a very old structure, and I'm not saying that the FA structure is a bad structure, I believe that the, the, the football industry is evolving and has evolved. And because of that, the, the structure needed to evolve as well. And the FA to FC exercise started in 2019. And 2020 was the first year of uh, privatization movement. And the privatization process was, was split into stages as well. The first stage was to, to actually for the FAs to create a FC. Right? So they needed to register the company, create a board of directors, and that's the, the first step right? towards uh, having a private ownership and opportunity to, to allow other ownerships not uh, by the FA 100% in itself. So that, that started at the end of 2019. That process went fairly smoothly. Uh, there was already uh, takeovers, discussions happening, and you know uh, the country fit, uh, ran into the wall in March 2020. And so we went through the privatization process in the pandemic. And I have to say, there's some blessing that said that the football industry faced the pandemic during the transition. So the reality check is that if the FAs did not exist, the FCs would struggle as 100% private owners with no football matches, with salaries to pay, with no fans coming with sponsors running away, with higher operations costs in the pandemic to play the game in itself, uh, they would struggle without the support of local government to take up uh, that, um, how you say, uh, crisis that the industry was facing. But nevertheless, during the pandemic, and even in the start of 2020, there were already takeover. Now, fast forward to 2022, XOX, the latest corporate to take over a, a struggling club in Pera has seen the evolution of more and more private sectors. So Red One at PDRM, QNET at PJ City, uh, there's the privatization of Penang, the efforts to privatize in Kedah, uh, the effort, the privatization in Selangor, where the, the FA involvement is still there in terms of club, uh, if, in terms of youth development, in Johor privatization, Sabah is happening, the, the, the branching out. Uh, Sarawak uh, still struggling with the privatization, but nevertheless showing great efforts. Um, so uh, as we come out of this endemic stage and or into this end- endemic stage, I believe there will be more and more corporate sector and more corporate investment coming into the space. You know, we've got even a local entrepreneur like like Zam uh, Norizam Tukiman from uh, that has taken over uh, Kelantan. That have struggled for many years with debt and 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 overdue salaries, uh, so Kelantan in itself is moving. So whilst it's not as smooth as we would have liked, uh, it we we have to come to reality that this we face the pandemic. Uh, I speak to my counterparts in Japan in Korea, and you know besides the first division, all second division clubs are struggling. You know, pe- clubs are bankrupt or have a lot of debt. I think you've read about it. You know, whether it's a Barcelona or Juventus or whoever. Going through the pandemic was a was a was a very painful exercise, very painful phase. But nevertheless, I must give credit to the clubs. You know, they got through 2020 and 2021 through the pandemic. And the biggest source of income of all football clubs is match day revenue, tickets, merchandise, broadcast revenue, sponsorships. And when you can't even activate sponsors, the sponsors can't come to the stadium. There's you're playing behind closed doors. You know, broadcast is limited, and you, you, but you've got hundred percent salaries to still pay. Um, it's not easy, right? So it's it's. I think they've done very well to get through the pandemic. Uh, it could have been done better, but definitely, uh, you know, it's it's not as simple looking from the outside looking in. And we always are very critical of 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 uh, of how football is operated. You know. Um, 
if you are a Manchester or a Liverpool fan amongst you, you could have an argument about your team. You know, who should have played, what minute you should have come in, the club should buy this player, that owner should leave, you know, this investor should come in. We all have an opinion and that's the beauty of the game, football. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I, I tell you, getting a football organisation, at that time I was half in FAM and then half my time in, in MFL. Uh, the pandemic was... Uh, was an amazing experience that you you would never wish onto someone else, man. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely. And and speaking of critical areas, I mean salaries. Despite the privatization process, I mean there are still teams that are unable to fulfill the contractual uh, obligation towards paying their players' salaries. So, what sort of action has MFL taken in prevent such situation? Okay, um, on salaries, uh, when I was in FAM, uh, so FAM is more the regulatory body. They were the licensing body at that time. The licensing body now, or the licensing uh, committee now sits with MFL. It was in FAM before. Uh, in FAM, uh, when I joined, the total amount of active cases, yeah, that means cases with decisions, was 232. Right, 232 overdue cases with decisions by FAM status committee yet to be paid. Uh, if I if I check the FAM records today, I think the that that number is now ten, right? Mm-hmm. Ten okay. active cases, right? So that ten active cases shows you the progress in in reducing the number of. There are still some repeat offenders, uh, clubs that are maybe mismanaging, and hence why we did the finance workshop yesterday. Uh, it's to help clubs manage through the pandemic, out of the pandemic, overspending, budgeting, you know, spend within your means, how to look at uh, football financing, which is very different than traditional industry, corporate uh, spending. And uh, I believe there's a lot of progress in this space. Uh, in, in recent times, the efforts is to ensure that the licensing process uh, uh, is the stick and carrot of, of uh, these overdue exercises. There are still, but let's remember, uh, social media complaining and a decision by court is two different things. Huh? So the, the, you see a lot of people speaking about, I didn't get paid on social media, right? Mm-hmm. But it does not translate to a decision in a case. So, and this is where sometimes news and social media play its part of really uh, creating a, a, a situation that is maybe bigger than any. So a player, for example, can turn around and say, you know, I didn't get paid, but you didn't get paid what? Your bonus. You didn't get paid something that was not contracted to you. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to address that. Uh, and, and PFAM, uh, uh, the Professional Players Association, they work very closely with me when I was with FAM, now that I'm in MFL, and they're very happy that, you know, the 232 cases is now 10. Uh, they know that, that, on my uh, in my capacity, I do the best for the players to ensure that they get paid without needing for it to go to court. Uh, so come to some amic- amicable solution along the way, so nobody is left behind. Uh, they understand that you, for me to do that, I still need to protect the football clubs. You know, when I close a football club, people say, "Okay, so don't give them a license." But you know, if I don't give them a license because they didn't pay ten players means I put about 150 people out of jobs because you have your senior team, you have your president cup team, your Berlier team, you have your coaches, you have your, your kit men, your doctors, your physios, you know. So, so uh, the, the weighing out of, the, of where you are, the, the depth of the club, the, the, how bad the position is, you would, have, you would be forced. If you didn't have any emotions or practical sense, you would pull the license immediately. Pera would have not played in the league, if in February or March we decided to pull the plug on in, of because of Perak, right? But today Perak has survived that that the very dark period, a very traumatic period with a, a listed co taking over, right? So you've got a corporate like XOX taking over, and that's really what we want. So the savior of of Perak at the end of the day was a huge corporate organization now coming on board. So. It's a, not an easy exercise uh, trying to balance the clubs, the players, the industry at the same time. Losing Pera is like losing fabric of Malaysian football. They were the founding members of, of FAM. Uh, and 
and they they contribute a lot of commercial value to the league. You know, losing Perak means losing an entire state. You know? Yeah. So as CEO of a league, as as a guardian of the industry, there is so many balls that I have to juggle at the same time, and and it's not mere simple decision as hey, if they don't pay the salaries, pull the license. But if you pull the license, who still pays them because the debt still exists. Yeah. Right? Do I fish them on and I and I with a stick and carrot, you know, force them to still make payments or pull the license because then there's the 10 players that were owed salaries, who did they go to for the for the salaries now? Because mm-hmm. the club is closed, right? So so it's not as easy, man. It's not as easy. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 Stuart, you're saying these 10, 10 cases and all these are all the court decisions, yeah. So so and, yes, and this is court, a football court, So uh, okay. So in in the judicial system in 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 football, mm-hmm. uh, player complaints go to the FAM status committee. This mm-hmm. has now changed to they go to the NDRC, which is the National Dispute Resolution Chambers. The National Dispute Resolution Chambers is two sides of the table. There will be three lawyers from PFAM, which are representing the players. There will be three lawyers from the league representing the clubs. And there will be a chairman, right? So Mm -hmm. they will debate the case and make decisions accordingly. So there is no vested interest on any one side. And they they shall shall make a decision accordingly. And all of these people are lawyers. They are not fellows from this club or that association. Mm -hmm. They are lawyers appointed to sit and in and, and this and discuss these cases. If you are a coach, you'd go to the status committee. If you're a player, you go to NDRC. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. And and is and for the player, is this the only avenue for them to, to go if they face stuff like this? Or you know, is does it like our labor laws and our you know, like as a as a as a normal guy working out there, will this apply to a football player as well? So um, the, the, the basic principle is that you have to exhaust all judicial processes in the football uh, court before mm-hmm. you take it to civil court. I so see. you cannot just take it to civil court. So as you sign, mm-hmm. so it's like, mm-hmm. it's like having rules and house rules, right? This is the house rules of football. Okay. Uh, to play, to participate in the industry, you will abide by FIFA regulations, by FAM statutes, by the competition regulations. If you breach the fact that when you go mm-hmm. to civil court, uh, the civil court will kick it back and say you will have to exhaust the entire football judicial process and only after which you can come to common court. But uh, that will be an exercise that they have gone through. Nevertheless, I have to say that the players have uh, fantastic support from PFAM. PFAM is, a, is, a, is, a, is the players association and they are there with one uh, main objective is to protect the players' interests. And players that may not have legal background have a door to knock, a phone to call to get Isham, mm-hmm. the CEO, who's who's a is a fantastic advocate of uh, players' rights, uh, to go to them and and they will protect the players' interest. But the player must have uh, a, a just complaint. You know, is are they complaining about something that is legally not bound by the club, or have they uh, are they complaining about something that they may have faulted themselves you know, and, and PFM will advise them accordingly. Mm, yeah, so so why I ask is just want to give our listeners some context. Huh? Like, you know, in case a player goes through this, you know, it's not like they can just, just go to a civil court like that. Yeah, they have to just Correct. exhaust whatever but, avenues within the football. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I, I have to say, even in FIFA, foreign players go to FIFA, local players come to the FAM uh, judicial systems. Uh, players always get the how you say it, they are they they always get the the, the position of, of sympathy right because they are the ones that that are being being how you say uh, the the one with the shorter end of the straw right and and hopefully they will be able to have all the documents in place and up uh, and you know 90 percent out of a hundred uh players win cases Right, because the, the 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 breach of the contract may be on the club side, but I've also seen in some circumstances that the player was the, the initiator of the breach, you know, disciplinary issues. Uh, there may be other areas, you know, not not mm-hmm. always when a club doesn't pay a player a salary, it's always that the club is wrong, right? There there may be a reason behind it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But it always comes off like that, yeah. I mean, when when somebody hears, oh, players are not getting paid again, must be the club problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I have to yeah, say, yeah. I mean, I've I've seen, I've seen, I've seen the entire spectrum. Yeah. Uh, I've seen both both uh, both sides uh, mm-hmm. being the naughty uh, mm-hmm. people. Okay. But I have to say, the clubs uh, go out of their way uh, to pay salaries during the pandemic. Mm. When they were earning zero, they were literally earning zero and spending more because now they had to have this, you know, quarantine-based training. So they had to house everybody in hotels, train in a bubble, play in a bubble, increase yeah. all of these SOPs. No crowd, no merchandise, sponsors pulling up, yeah. and where do they get the money, right? Mm. So uh, with zero income, they did it with the passion of the owners, the structure of the club, the support from state government, you know. And they and they got through the pandemic, you know, without any of our clubs closing down or bankrupt, right? Yeah. So yeah. yes, salaries were late for some clubs, but uh, Sarawak, for example, was one of those uh, in trouble at the end of last season. But they seem to have kind of uh, got over that rocky period. Uh, but I know, you know, a lot of clubs in Malaysia are not as uh, financially comfortable as we would like them to be. But a lot of it is also cash flow problems. You know, it, it's the industry recovery. Football must still go on, and they are still trying to catch up as well. Mm-hmm. I think that's a very good explanation from Stuart. Let's talk about the uh, JDT run in the AFC Champions League. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there's not many other team. Uh, of course, they haven't participated yet in the Mokeda and KL, but. Uh, yeah. Thousands of them uh, eliminate, eliminating one of their amazing success, especially in the AFC Cup, where they might move to the knockout stage. I think yeah. it's kind of a big task to us. So in the in the bigger picture, is there any way MF, MFL can guide the other teams, especially following the JDT blueprint? Maybe not in terms of finance, but at least in terms of structure. Yeah. Way they organize, think- way they control the player, the way they, you know, the yeah, players yeah. like football, right? I, I, I give you one simple example of how uh, the, the JDT has done really well in terms of uh, continuity and planning. Uh, you, you see very rarely a JDT changing their foreign players. right? Your mm-hmm. foreign players tend to stick to them, uh, stick with them for four, three, four, five years maybe. you know. And uh, these players uh, are chosen uh, correctly, well uh, managed in a in a position that they also don't want to go to another team, and that that stability, that stability in itself uh, allows the club to to grow with these players because you know as foreign players arrive, is adaptation is always the the hardest part, right? Um, JDT has done obviously amazingly well in the ACL, but they didn't achieve that uh, at the get go. This has been their maybe their third year, I think, in the ACL already, and uh, and they've they've achieved what they achieved by getting beaten every year, you know, and and not being embarrassed of getting beaten, they came back and got beat again, you know, and and I believe that uh, that uh, attitude, that attitude, and that uh, determination of uh, of proving that they can survive in this pond, you know, they're not so. Uh, weak and they and they improve year on year. Uh, they improve, right? So that attitude, I believe, is something that we must start from because that attitude and that determination will allow you to spend and manage within your means. Football is not uh, what you see on the field is the stability or and the determination of a club outside the field. So in their investments in the right areas. Uh, from expert resources, from people, uh, from the infrastructure. And I said, you know, you, we, we, let's not measure it by the beauty of the infrastructure, right? You can pay $1,000 for a pair of boots or you can pay $300 ringgit for, the, for a pair of boots. doesn't make you a better football player, right? But whatever that uh, JDT has invested in is calculated to the result that they wanted from that infrastructure. So a training center, for example, right? So having a training center with, with what type of equipment, their own medical facility, their own rehab areas, getting players to recover from injury as fast as possible in the best way as possible and putting them back on the field as fast and better than they were before they were injured. 
I think those are the type of things that that people go it goes unseen, and they think that you know only if you got money you can do this. I think if you plan well and you invest well, uh, these things can come. You know, clubs in in Malaysia are looking south in in JDT and trying to emulate the the direction that this club has taken and shown its its success. Uh, I hope the clubs don't try and change uh, to chase trying to keep up with the expense of the club because everybody should just spend within their means. Uh, JDT has a has an ability of uh, of, of uh, increasing their revenue and, and obtaining revenues, uh, but the clubs have to find their own. Everybody in their own marketplace, in their own spaces, uh, have their own opportunities and abilities to raise revenue, and that right investment in the right places equate to the results on the field. So I think my 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 how you say my position as CEO of the league, uh, seeing a JDT progress in the in the ACL is is a stamp of of uh, progress of the league in itself. You know, and I, and that I have to give uh, commendation to to the previous leadership that to uh, Ghani uh, who was the CEO before me, uh, and that to Hamidin who was the president then. Uh, all of these results uh, come. Uh, with the efforts of that collective movement, so JDT is a uh, is a uh, obviously the the shining light in the a- AFC uh, qualification that they've uh, done. But I believe that uh, Kuala Lumpur and Kedah are also very serious about the AFC qualification this year. Uh, uh, KL have a great opportunity in uh, KL, sorry KL City has a great opportunity. They are playing in Malaysia. They only have two games. Against a uh, Tampines and a uh, Indonesian club, uh, and and it's it. I think they have all the opportunity to also to get to the round of sixteen. It will be amazing for Malaysian football to get three clubs in Asian competitions into the round of sixteen. Yeah, amazing indeed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, Stuart. Now let's uh, let's look ahead. So you know, where would you like to see MFL? Let's say in the next five years. Wow. Um, if I'm still around, I, I I would love to be able to to see MFL uh, sitting uh, on top of ASEAN at least from a from a position in a in a league and a in a value. Um, I believe Malaysia, being a natural footballing country, has a tremendous opportunity to build this industry. But to build this industry requires not only work of trying to fix MFL, but trying to fix uh, the impression of government across sport. You know, uh, today, in even in Dozum, uh, the, the Department of Statistics, uh, uh, sports is still seen as a recreation, right? Um, yeah. mm-hmm. So in, in terms of ability to, to seek government support and funding and, and the growth of an industry, uh, if you buy a pair of boots today to play in a social league or in a in a semi pro league in your state, um, the pair of boots is registered to the retail industry, right? It's not registered to the sports industry. Uh, if if somebody come, if we have a Malaysia versus a Brazil game tomorrow, and there's tourists coming in, it's the income is registered to tourism, not to sports, right? So, mm-hmm. uh, for me to champion the growth of this industry. Uh, the the recognition of the industry, the efforts of of sports in itself as a totality has to has to grow together. Then um, we can look at opportunities of of now uh, government seeing the true value of football, the professional football industry, the surrounding economy, the the the, the revenues that government earns uh, from this professional industry. And with that, we hope that the gov- government can come on board with us to grow the football industry. Because um, I, I, I tell people uh, the Premier League, because it's, it's, the, it's the world's biggest league and it's always in our face. And I share this only because this is something that I truly believe, right? So the, the Premier League before uh, the Sky investment was the English Division One, right? Mm-hmm. And the English Division One was a league of. Uh, professionals that you know they were not really professional right they were they were they were enjoying life a lot of drinkers a lot of 
drugs, gambling, a lot of everything, mm-hmm. right? It was a, yeah. it was, it wasn't the Premier League, right? Uh, Sky overpaid, overpaid it by a lot, right? And that seed investment trickled down to football clubs. So the global brand that you know your Liverpool, your Manchester United, they were, they were, they were football clubs run by 12, 20 people, right? Uh, but they were not global brands, glo- global corporates like they are today. They were global football clubs that you knew from afar. Um, today, the result of what the Premier League is, is because of that, that, that first Sky investment, right? Uh, and Malaysian football, I believe, I truly believe, is, is that, that we need that first uh, seed funding and and bolster funding that can drive the industry because the clubs need it, the industry needs it, and we can uplift this entire industry to a to a point of self sustaining, right? Um, and I believe that that's what my my vision for for MFL would be that at at the time of the end of five years is a sustainable, professionally, commercially driven industry, and the peripheral surrounding economies is recognized and supported by government because uh, I'm, not, I'm not seeking government money to get there, but it's government uh, support through policy change, through uh, change of, of, of uh, measurement of the industry. And that will in itself snowball the, the progress uh, of uh, you know, making MFL maybe the top, top league in ASEAN and in the future, you know, hopefully it's in the tip of the tongue of people that when they speak about the J League and the K League, they yeah. will speak about the M League at, in the, at the same breath, right? So that's that's my hope. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's that's very wonderful to hear that. So, yeah. Okay, guys. Uh, any last questions from yourself? Can I ask you guys, who do you sure. support, man? Um, locally or internationally? Yeah, locally. Now don't make up a team. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I would leave my international team a bit later, but uh, yeah. locally, uh, well, since I was born in Malacca, I you know, yeah. tend to have a little bit soft spot for them and follow them closely. Yep. Yeah. When was the last you went for a match, man? Uh, I was there when the match between Malacca and KL just recently. Oh, uh, okay, uh, good. Which uh, was the... I think it was the final nail in the coffin for the Malacca coach at that time, I believe. Yes, 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 <laughs> yeah. yes. Okay. Okay, okay. And then next? Yeah, Stuart, st- st- Stuart, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm a Slamo supporter lah. since since the 90s, the Carol Strom yeah. six days. Oh the my Pebble God. Pebble Pebble yeah. Pebble <laughs> Zora, Zora, Zora yes, Marks. yes. And all that, you know, I've been Slango, Slango fan lah. So the last, I mean, yeah. the last match I, I watched was uh, with Sivan and Bala was the JDT and KL game in the KLFA Stadium. Uh, last year? Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, when it just oh, opened right. up, uh, when things just started to open yes, up for the yes, pandemic. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we, we were there. Yeah, yeah. And Bala? Yeah, yeah as for me, I've... Uh, Slango la. Same here, what the uh, passion for Elvina. We have born in Slango, so we support Slango since the Hazma Annan days. Yeah. Oh, my yeah, God. Was... No, I mean, I mean uh, you know, I, I, I had a meeting today with a potential corporate partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the guy sitting in the room was 27 years old. Uh, he follows foreign football. Mm-hmm. Plays futsal and social football. Mm-hmm. Okay. Has no clue about Malaysian football, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I, it, it it opens my eyes that we have low hanging fruit of these 20, 30 year old boys that have no clue about Malaysian football, but they are huge football fans, right? They are the mm-hmm. low hanging fruit that mm-hmm. I have not reached. So, mm-hmm. you know, we, we fill stadiums, you know, and in, in mass numbers, but there is this lost generation yeah. of, yes. of fans that that don't know Azmanan, don't know Pavel yeah. Goricic, don't know Jaya Gantan, don't know K. Yeah. Gunalan, doesn't exactly. know <laughs> Mehmet Durukovic so, playing uh, no, first now, you know? No, when you start oh, seeing all these names, uh, wow, very walking down memory lane, man. <laughs> yeah, so, but you know, there is these guys that, that yeah. left Malaysian football, right? And yeah. my ambition is that, you know, these guys, you can be a Liverpool supporter of Manchester United or Arsenal or Chelsea, yeah. but you have to also have a team in, in Malaysia. You must have a team in Malaysia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this support your local team, it starts with you, right? The fans, you know, the fans are the, the catalyst to, to any sustainable football club. 
Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. if there is the original jersey that is 99 ringgit, but you still want to buy the cheap, the fake one at 29 ringgit, okay lah. You know what to do. But then you also don't criticize your football club lah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but if the if it's a 10 dollar ticket and the club raises it to 15 ringgit, because mm-hmm. of inflation and and trying to do more for the football club, understand right? What what they're trying to do. I understand a fan. I was the guy with like you, you know, Stadium Deca, queuing up, you know, yeah. getting into the stadium, buying cheap burgers, taking the bus from Kelana Jaya, 33 bus, Sri Jaya to Kota Raya, walking oh, to the stadium, oh, walking back. Yeah. You know, so I, I was that. I was that person, right? So I understand the fans' frustration, but football has leap forward, right? Leap forward. So if you go to UK and if we always compare a hey, Malaysian football club, so you know you see there lah, you see there lah, you know they do this, they do that, right? But mm. you know, understand when you go there, you pay 50 pounds for a ticket, right? You 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 buy 300 ringgit jerseys, right? So mm. the economics is tremendously different, right? Tremendously different. It's not really so, an apple to apple comparison, basically. No, no, it's not, yeah. man. It's a it's a it's a it's the same sport, but an entire different dynamics, right? Mm-hmm. So hopefully, mm-hmm. hopefully, as the clubs prove themselves to the fans, right? And I always challenge the clubs, please. The fans are, I I believe the fans will believe what they are paying for if you show them value, right? If you if you if you prove that okay with more money it equates to us investing in better toilets and seats and and you know and you know match the experiences that are not just merely parking and queuing and sitting on wet seats and full of uh, bird poo and <laughs> you know leave, leaving and having one dollar cold burgers you know I believe I believe people want to feel that okay I don't mind paying more but I want to know what I'm paying for. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so I believe that evolution should happen in this next few years as as clubs professionalize themselves, and you get club clubs now being taken over by corporates, and I believe the corporates will see, especially you know, this customer service experience that that they believe that should be upgraded. Mm-hmm. Yes, definitely, definitely. So for the international team, guys, you guys go ahead first. Hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, Stuart. I mean, I support a team that's struggling, lah. These days, all our glory days, ah. Allah <laughs> ma. See, you're even painful to say the name of the team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Manchester United, lah. Oh, Allah ma. Bala. <laughs> Me, uh, basically, I started off as Blackburn Rovers, and then I'm a hardcore fan of Juventus. So, oh, so not English, lah. Not English teams, lah. No, I think Blackburn Rovers are, but I think I just kind of after they really get a few years back. I mean, their low profiles so or just like just yeah. kind of what they're doing. But yeah. Juventus is yeah. my, if, my, if my Italian league team is Juventus from the uh, Baggio yeah. days. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah I was yeah. a Baggio fan. Uh, so yeah, my English my Italian team would have been uh, Juventus. Mm-hmm. Uh, so because my two, my, yeah, Baggio and Zidane both played there. You know, so so after Baggio, yeah. my uh, favorite. So my dog, my my dog is named Zizu. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, after, after, yeah, after okay. Zidane. Okay. I, think I was liking more like Phil Silo, Ferrara, Montero. Yeah. Is even your call? Even well, as for my team, uh, we are trying to make it back to the Premier League. We have a game this Sunday against Nottingham Forest, and that team is Huddersfield Town. Believe it or not. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Huddersfield Town. <laughs> wow! Not many of you around, man. I think indeed, I'm the only indeed. one. I think yeah. I think I'm the only one. President of the fan club in Malaysia, lah. I'm the president. I'm the member, secretary. You name it, everything. There's nobody else. <laughs> But you're doing better than Manchester United for sure, lah. <laughs> I think Steven did came on an article uh, somewhere in the Star. I think for I think when the, when they were promoted, uh, yeah. when yeah. they made it to the Premier League the last round. So yeah, so a big a big weekend for Steven indeed. Yeah. Yep. Wow, wow, wow. Fingers okay, crossed. Fingers yeah. crossed. Yeah. Okay. When what what day is the game Saturday? Uh, sun Sunday. Sunday at about like twelve eleven thirty uh night. So wow, it's the okay. it's the championship it's, playoff. It's, it's before the Champions League final, right? Even I think. Uh Champions League final. I think it's on Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. But I, I, if it, if it I had to pick an English team, my team would have been now playing in the Champions League final. Lah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> no, <laughs> but but so I I like creative midfielders. So mm-hmm. uh, my my 
I, I supported Liverpool when I was young because my brother was a man. My, my brand, brother is a manual supporter. Uh, mm-hmm. So you needed, you couldn't be that same team. But I, <laughs> I love Peter Beardsley. You know, not many people ah, appreciated. Okay, okay. I see, appreciated I see. Him. So I, 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 I started supporting Liverpool because of Peter Beardsley. I so, see, I see. When, when, when you, when you said creative midfield at that era, I thought maybe you said John Barnes. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, I mean, I, I, yeah, okay. I think, but for me, the Beardsley was a bit more unpredictable. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, the way he runs, crafty, yeah. yeah, yeah, very, very crafty, and yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, okay. thanks, guys. Hey, so it oh. was, yeah, it was really good, good having this chat with you, as Stuart. Yeah, really, thank you for yeah. coming on board our show, man. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, by the way. Yeah. No problem, man. Uh, my pleasure. Yeah. Thank you for su- supporting Malaysian football. We mo- need more of you guys. Uh, I I need more of you guys to kind of uplift the industry. So there's always it's easy to speak about the negativities uh, in any industry, especially in football. The spotlight is always uh, on us, uh, on the teams. Uh, I must say the teams are spectacular. You know, we go through. Our day not from not many understanding how hard it is. Mm-hmm. The clubs are fantastic, you know, and I, I have a great relationship with all the CEOs, and I and I always appreciate their feedback, you know. So as I as we discussed earlier, you know, I'm always open to criticism and and opinion because I feel that always sometimes when you're in the circle, you 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 don't hear and you don't see what's happening, you know, the the, the thing in front mm-hmm. of your nose, you might miss it, right? So, yeah. so we need more of you to help uplift the industry, and we hope that you know this this, this sport that we love and this country that we love, uh, there mm-hmm. will be some some you know something to be sh- to shout about uh, as a country and as a league in the future, man. Yes, definitely, definitely. We'll do our best. You know, we, the whole reason why we started this podcast is mainly just to talk about football, and of course, you know, a big part of it is has to be Malaysian football because that's what most all three of us grew up on. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Any last words, Elvin? Bala, no? Yeah. Just. Uh, uh, yeah. Just really the great insight, great, great, great interview and great session we had with Stuart. So really, thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you, guys. Uh, Bala, uh, Elvin, and Sivan. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully, we'll do this again in the future. Um, yes. Always open to to more conversation at the right time. Okay, um, definitely. If you, if you if you need anything, guys, uh, reach out to me. Uh, right. Happy to 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 collaborate. Okay, definitely. All right. I appreciate it a lot, Stuart. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank yeah. you so Thanks, much, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good night, guys. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. With that, folks, we will end this week's episode of the Bola Bola Show. Thank you for listening. Till the next one. Goodbye. <laughs>